everyone. Welcome to our stories behind product number seven. So if you're like me and you sit long hours while working, you would know that our bodies are not designed to sit and designing a good chair has never been easy. So my name is Zoya Demirbelek and I'm a professor of industrial design at UNSW. I welcome you all from the beautiful, beautiful country where I live and work. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this unceded land. I would like to pay my respect to elders, both past and present. And today is Wellness Day at UNSW. And this evening, our presenter is Carlo Sheib. Welcome, Carlo. It is lovely to have you here. Carlo will... for the invite. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Paolo will be presenting the story of C-Motion, an office chair he designed while working at CEDIS, uh, a leading German manufacturer of office furniture. So Carlo is one of our 2005 alum of the UNSW Industrial Design Honors Program. His graduation project, actually I have an image here. There we go. His graduation project was a chair for musicians. And then one story I recall uh, when Carlo was a student with us is that he bought himself a secondhand Wilkan office chair. And then he went to the uh, Wilkan factory in Sydney to get it reupholstered. And that was the beginning of his relationship with that company and with designing office chairs. So during his studies, Carlo worked as a designer for Wilkan Asia Pacific in a cross-functional role, including custom design solutions, interior planning, photography, and exhibition design. And in 2006, he moved to Germany and began to work at Wege, uh, a sister company uh, of Wilkan, designing products outside the corporate office sector uh, for brands such as uh, Lamy, Tonon, Rolf Benz, and Loewe. And during this time, Carlo worked on his first complete uh, task chair, the on chair. And I have an image here too. For Wilkan, a chair affording a unique three-dimensional dynamic sitting experience. And you can see here Carlo modeling the chair. Uh, so after completing that chair, uh, Carlo joined ITO Design in Nuremberg, working with international companies, including Howard, uh, Herman Miller, Kinarp, uh, Profim, and Cities. And Carlo joined Sidus in 2017 as an in-house product designer, where he developed four product families, including the C motion chair. And he currently works in product innovation, design, and sustainability at Vitra in Basel, Switzerland. So now I will hand it over to, to you, Carlo. Over to you. And I need to Great. Stop. <laughs> Thanks for the intro. Um... Yeah, um, I'm really happy to be here to be able to share this uh, story, development story for C Motion, um, which is quite unique um, for me uh, because usually task chair developments take a very long time. But um, in this particular case, it was actually a very fast development. Um, so, yeah, I'll just share my screen um, and uh, what the requirements and, and goals were for the project. Then into the concept phase, um, give you a bit of a, a look at how the, the concept developed, um, then the design phase, and finally the construction phase, um, and you know, look at some of the production processes involved and um, yeah, the different stages there. So basically, see motion. Um, the goal from the beginning was to have a very simple um, task chair, so a chair for, for working at desks, but most task chairs, they have these huge mechanisms underneath and, and they um, have a lot of adjustments which make them highly ergonomic, but most people don't know how to use them. And um, that's a big problem because if you're sitting on a chair which is adjusted incorrectly, then you're not benefiting yourself. Um, and um, especially with uh, a lot of these um, co-working zones and uh, hot desking uh, situations, people don't really even think about adjusting the chair, they just sit there. So. Um, the, uh, the goal with this particular chair was to give the best kind of comfort you could um, to the largest percentile of people, but at the same time, keeping the chair really simple. Um, so um, we also were keeping in mind like um, this kind of cross-functional um, um, environments where teams are switching, like programming environments, people working very close to one another. So the chair also had to be quite lightweight and um, quite open. And obviously all the different um, EN requirements, there are different types uh, of requirements that we wanted to achieve. 
And there was an online uh, goal. So the chair was, was to be one of the first chairs to be sold online at C uh, by Cedus. So that was also kind of like a goal, having fit into a particular um, box size. So for design, I think the first kind of um, step was just to map out all these different requirements and maybe also start thinking about the different possibilities um, that we had for each component. So um, if we're looking at the backrest, and I think the seat and um, the armrests, they were the main components and um, just trying to kind of uh, break down all the different things that needed to be kind of um, uh, worked on. Even though the chair is one whole, you kind of just break it down to begin with to kind of brainstorm possibilities. Um, we also had some requirements for the upholstery. So it has had to be exchangeable to make um, repairability and um, um, yeah, maintenance a lot easier, especially for facility managers or for um, people, you know, working at home. Um, also, um, yeah, just a very customizable kind of um, piece of furniture. So that's, uh, yeah, basically all the requirements that we had. Uh, and based on that, we dove into the concept phase together as a team. Um, it was a really uh, team intensive uh, um, uh, process at the beginning together with our engineers. And we were looking at um, how to achieve the simple, the best ergonomics with the simplest kind of possible uh, structure. And obviously we wanted to get away from having a mechanism because a mechanism under the chair requires you to adjust. So we wanted to come up with a system that was, um, yeah, a weight activated system. So basically you just sit on the chair and the chair um, reacts to your own weight and um, you're able to basically get the best kind of comfort and movement uh, based on your weight. So. Um, we started off with a lot of mock-ups, and this had to go really quick at the beginning. <laughs> um, I was just starting out at Sados. I think I was in my, I don't know, fourth month, and we received this um, um, challenge from, um, yeah, top management. And there were also some uh, potential um, concepts from external designers. So we were kind of also in a bit of a race and a competition <laughs> that we didn't want to be in, but uh, that was the situation. And um, the team really came together and we um, came up with all these different um, possible kinematic solutions. And uh, what you're seeing right now are like the, we didn't actually have too many of them. Um, so we quite early on got to a solution which was quite um, promising. So um, what you see here are like iterations of that, um, working together with, um, engineers, our engineering team, we kind of came up with a system, which is similar to a parallelogram. So basically, um, there are kind of either four points or two points and, um, the rest are kind of simulated points in order to create, um, a, a movement and, um, yeah, we just played around with all these little uh, models and uh, tried to figure out which ones give us the best results and the kind of like these kinds of small models that we have here. So basically it gives you just a, a sense of how the movement could be. And um, this is practically very close to the final movement that we had, um, which we really liked because um, we didn't want a lot of weight activated um, mechanisms, mechanisms on the market that were more or less like a box under the seat. They lifted the seat too far up, so it created a lot of pressure. And um, yeah, we came up with a solution that was uh, super comfy and still didn't um, yeah, create that pressure in the front portion of the legs. So you can see here, basically we had this parallelogram principle with two turning points um, in the back. But in the front, um, the material flex, these kind of two bands that uh, um, go out towards the front of the seat, and they're working together within the system to create this movement. So um, we didn't require any kind of springs or anything. It was all just this material um, um, spring that was um, yeah, assisting in the movement. And you're kind of working against your own weight. So when you lean back, you're lifting yourself up. So you know, regardless of what weight you have, um, you're able to kind of get the best adjustment automatically without having to, um, yeah, turn any dials or anything like that. Um, it does have some caveats that, 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 for example, if you have a very high torso or your proportions are slightly different, it may react differently. But um, I think that was a good compromise, um, yeah, in this particular case. 
so yeah we then we um went into like a one-to-one -one prototype once we had um uh, small mock-ups that we thought were um were looking good we kind of built it one-to-one -one using the workshop downstairs and um just milled out out of um yeah a similar kind of um uh, polymer um these two spring elements just to get a sense of how it would work and also to be able to experiment a bit with the movement and and shift the turning point slightly um to get the right um uh, proportion. So you want to kind of uh, a synchronized mechanism usually has um, a certain amount of degrees recline in the back toward um, compared to the seat. So we wanted to keep that, um, yeah, um, or design it so that it's uh, as comfortable as possible. And um, that's us in our um, Denkraum. So actually the the building we were in had two levels, but there was a secret level <laughs> at the top, which not nobody knew about, which was great. Um, it was the, the kind of the design room um, where we had our materials and the photo shooting studio, and um, it was super cool. You get you got there um, through this uh, staircase that many didn't know about, so it was a quiet space, and you could also eavesdrop onto the meetings downstairs. So <laughs> it was uh, yeah, pretty cool. So we use that um, also for a lot of the prototype uh, testing and, and building things together um, uh, within the team. So yeah, that was the first uh, rough prototype that we had. We reinforced the spring a bit with um, steel spring to um, to adjust um, uh, the amount of flex a bit, but we were getting towards a solution that we felt really comfortable with and um, um, that we thought was, yeah, the correct solution for this project because really it showed the potential of being just two parts um, for the whole chair so the backrest and the seat um, we didn't yet know if we could combine the seat and the spring element together but um, that was the hope and yeah it could have been a complete chair basically out of two parts um, yeah in parallel started thinking about the chair structure so how could the chair be built um, uh, uh, what components, what materials. So some initial ideas were about having a mesh back, for example, and also um, how to dock the armrests onto the, um, the, the chair, which is quite tricky because we wanted to have a very lightweight kind of um, um, structure. But at the same time, we knew in the back of our heads that you have all these norms and, and some <laughs> pretty uh, terrible tests that the chair has to go through. So yeah, we wanted to try to uh, find a balance between those two. Um, so yeah, the first design concept, um, which was just roughly modeled in like uh, sub D modeling, not parametrically modeled, just uh, we were really under time constraint. So showed that, you know, the chair could be built basically um, with the heart of the chair being this kind of spring element um, uh, to which uh, the backrest is connected. So uh, it's basically those two parts. And if we were able to create or yeah, mold it together with a seat, it would be basically the whole chair. Um, in this case, we also had an additional um, seat shell um, that would be attached. And that's basically the whole chair. So um, um, that would provide you with the movement and everything. And uh, um, yeah, the height adjustment being the only adjustment that you have to make in order to, um, to get the right kind of um, position. And then obviously being able to attach the armrests, um, that was something that we wanted to have as an option and also make it as easy as possible for the um, end user. Yeah, so those were the first design concepts that we went into uh, uh, management with. And um, yeah, we felt really confident and I think <laughs> we were quite lucky. They were 100% kind of behind us. Um, uh, for this particular concept and from from an ergonomic standpoint it was also um better than what um yeah the competition the external competition so yeah we were super happy with that so at that stage um we say like the design phase starts um because this was just um yeah based on the technical uh, concept that we had and you could say that that final um um, concept was kind of designed, but it wasn't really. Um, it was just uh, sub D modeling, and <laughs> there was a lot of a lot of details missing. And um, so we started the design phase, um, looking at uh, all the different possibilities, so possible structures for the back, different materials we could use in order to achieve um, the comfort that we we wanted to 
Um, yeah, quick note, we, we initially thought about mesh, but for the price range of this chair, um, that was um, unfortunately not possible. So we had to kind of look at different uh, possibilities um, without having, um, yeah, the, the additional steps of um, using a mesh to, to attach to a frame that was um, from a cost perspective um, too high. So we were looking at co-molding solutions or the possibility of having two separate structures, so having a frame and then maybe like a flexible membrane. Um, and uh, we were also using, um, yeah, just simple augmented reality to compare the product um, that saved a lot of time. We actually didn't build that many design models um, for this project. We went straight into prototypes, which I'll show you in a bit. So augmented reality kind of helped uh, get a sense of proportions and size compared to the other products um, at Cedos without having to build these design models um, at each stage because it was going really fast. It would have been almost impossible to, to do that. Yeah, that's a small model I, I showed you. So we we kept on kind of refining um, uh, the turning points, uh, just small small changes, and maybe making slightly bigger model because then you're able to measure angles. Um, but um, yeah, this was kind of like combining design and functionality and trying to get a sense of what what's happening. Is it working exactly like the the one to one scale model? Yeah, so that's. Uh, Kurt, one of our model makers, and also I would say uh, he's got a lot of patents under his, uh, I don't know, under his belt or <laughs> under his fingers. He's, he's basically uh, really talented with his hands. He's able to mock up things really quickly. And if you have a technical idea, he's able to come up with a solution. So he was quite instrumental to this project. And um, yeah, he was uh, building the first uh, design model here. So non-functional model just to get a sense of um, the size and um, also start to explore the upholstery with these uh, parts, because um, as I'll show you, um, the upholstery was actually um, one of the trickier parts uh, of the project, um, surprisingly. So yeah, we were still kind of exploring different um, backrest structures, um, trying to figure out, you know, what kind of um, you know, structure would give us flexibility, but also at the same time, you know, the aesthetics of the um, the chair. Um, I don't talk too much about the aesthetics because it really was derived from the function of the chair and um, really eliminating like all unnecessary kind of um, material. So we were really trying to reduce it and, and, and make the chair as efficient as possible. So. Um, the design kind of came came out of that. Um, yeah, one of the, um, I think, later design models, I think it was the, the second, maybe the only uh, design model with this kind of back. And we had all kinds of issues. Um, I didn't know how to use um, Grasshopper or any of these new uh, programs for creating patterns. So <laughs> this was a, a iterative hand kind of painstaking process in in, CAD and um, yeah, until we kind of found a, a pattern um, that could be reproduced and then um, playing around in, in SolidWorks at the time to kind of create a smooth uh, pattern that was, wasn't that much fun. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then, yeah, we finally came to the, or made the decision to try to create the back out of a single part. So the whole time we were thinking, okay, you have this frame, you have this flexible material, and they're like, okay, would it be at all possible to kind of combine it and have it in one part? And what would that entail? And um, luckily we're working with some really good um, and, and technically um, competent suppliers uh, in Germany. And um, one of the technologies that they have is called uh, mono sandwich. So it's basically injecting two um, plastics um, after each other and in this case it's a polypropylene so you have like a polypropylene core um, which enables you to um, get the stiffness that you need um, uh, where the mechanism is but and on the outer sides of the frame but then at the same time um, being able to inject just a pure polypropylene to get the flexibility and the movement in the top part of the backrest so it's quite a complicated process but they've managed to do it in such a way that they can actually control where the different materials flow. Um, it's a bit of trial and error at, at some points, but it works really well. And um, that enabled us to basically combine the back into a single part. And this was um, a laser-centered part. So it's a 
3D printed um, one to one scale in a very, we yeah, have, I would say, material which highly represents uh, polypropylene with this glass reinforced uh, part uh, or, or um, midsection. And um, yeah, we were able to build that into the first kind of prototype, um, which was fully 3D printed, actually. And we only 3D printed um, uh, prototypes, which was quite, quite cool, very fast. Um, and efficient and enabled us to to um, test the chair um, uh, really uh, quickly and not have to wait for you know um, milling or combined kind of activities that usually would be in a development process. Um, yeah, this was looking at some arm pad variations. Again, we needed to have something. We didn't want to use glue. Uh, we wanted to have these parts as um, easy as possible to disassemble. So we were looking at um, click systems, how to be able to click the armrest uh, on easily, but also remove it in case um, something is damaged. So um, yeah, these were just some an exploration of, uh, of the arm pad itself, which had to be clipped on and also made sure that there were no kind of uh, intolerances were quite um, tight. And that's the first fully functional prototype that we uh, we built, um, completely um, 3D printed, except for the, the seat pad or the seat yeah, shell that was uh, milled in-house, but the rest was uh, laser centered. And um, yeah, uh, we were able to use this to start also looking at the upholstery development, which was uh, um, a really important part of the chair. At Klaus, uh, I'd say one of my favorite engineers. <laughs> he was, uh, yeah, instrumental as well in this chair because um, most engineers are kind of shying away or they want to add material, make things thicker. I think he was kind of <laughs> pushing even me into a, a, a direction which um, which was thinner and more lightweight. And um, yeah, he's uh, not afraid to kind of uh, um, explore these. Especially, you know, in, in this in this kind of case, um, his his um, yeah, his reputation is on the line because a lot of the engineers they they're quite scared. They have, they have to um, you know bear the brunt of management, or if something goes wrong with the tooling, a lot of it lands on their shoulders. So um, yeah, you have to really hand it to him for being um, really open to this idea and um, and yeah, pushing it even further. So yeah, one of my favorite engineers. <laughs> Um, yeah, so these were some of the tests that we did in the test lab downstairs. Um, there are all these um, machines and, and, and instruments that we use. Um, the standards have shifted a bit over the years, and so there are different kinds of um, testing um, rigs that we have. Um, some of it is a bit complicated to position, um, but um, in this case, we were only just measuring certain things like the S point. There's a certain point where the lumbar is um, that has to be measured from the seat um, pan. Um, and if you have a foam, then it's the compressed seat foam. So just all these kind of measurements that are required um, to make sure that we're in the right range. And um, there are no surprises for us uh, further down the road um, when we get it tested externally. And that's uh, Peppone, uh, Peppo um, uh, from Sardinia. He's uh, uh, the upholstery master um, at Sedos and um, taking his first critical look at the backrest and trying to think of how we can upholster this also with the possibility of being able to, to um, yeah, take it off easily. So it has to be exchangeable. The idea being like a mobile phone cover, you can just pull it off and, and attach a new one and be able to to clean it or um, in, in cases of damage, just completely um, replace it without having to send the whole chair back. So um, yeah, this was quite um, quite a challenge. And so that's just, uh, yeah, some images of the first functional prototype complete um, with uh, the final armrests. Oh no, not, not quite, not quite the final armrests, but yeah, um, very close to the end. And I think at this stage we're also, presenting the chair um, internally and getting people to sit on it and get give feedback um, um, regarding the movement and um, yeah, uh, the overall feel of the chair. So yeah, the construction phase, um, we worked very closely with um, supplier um, 
which um, built, you could say, test tooling. So because these um, springs in the chair are, are super important to the chair, we had to make sure that they, uh, first of all, were made out of the right material, but that they also um, yeah, didn't deform over time, that th there was the right amount of um, 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 water content is really important. I know I've, from experience, like sending things down to Australia, <laughs> sometimes uh, um, the humidity levels or the temperature can have a big effect. I remember we, we had these honeycomb tables that we sent down once and uh, that didn't go quite well. So there, there's a lot of things that um, are really um, uh, plugged into the materials so you have to get that right and um, investing in test tooling like in this case um, was really important um, and we were able to build these um, left and right kind of um, arms um, individually so not build the whole tool but just build each one of these each segments individually and then click them together in order to be able to test different types of materials um, what you see right now is like the the bath basically where we cooled up the parts after um, taking them out because we weren't there for a very long time, uh, maybe two days that we spent at the supplier. So we wanted to kind of um, inject as many different types of materials to get a sense of where we were um, heading. And then obviously building the, um, the chair as quickly as possible. In this case, we had like a steel plate that was connecting the two spring arms and um, yeah, being able to um, test the chair to see how it works. At the same time, also discussing like tooling. So you can imagine this under section, the heart of the chair is quite complicated. Um, you have to be able to um, create this kind of spring, but at the same time, you have to attach just seat. And at the same time, you have to be stiff enough, rigid enough um, where the gas lift is being um, connected. So um, there are all these different kind of requirements for this part and also being able to mold it um, uh, and have um yeah no kind of uh, variation um in 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 the materials so um that's really tough and um yeah that was part of the, the long term discussion as well with the supplier as well as the backrest the mono sandwich it looks quite easy but i think um the challenge was really how to inject the material um where to inject it and um in order to get the material types where you want it to be so now back to uh, some of the upholstery work. So in the meantime, Peppo had <laughs> maybe third or fifth iteration. So we were exploring using um, a mesh um, on the back uh, of the backrest in order to um, show some of the structure of the back and also to increase breathability. Um, and um, for the seat, we were also exploring different kind of um, uh, materials um, such as 3D knits or um, just more elastic materials so that it's easy for the customer or for the um, the end user to to apply it. Uh, also working with a, um, a knit supplier for um, there were two actually two variations of the backrest. So there was um, we wanted to be able to use all the standard fabrics at Zedos or most of them. Um, so depending on the customer, if they want a particular kind of um, uh, fabric, you can combine it. At the same time, we were working on a special um, th completely three D knit. Um, um, upholstery solution. So this here is for the, the standard fabric version. And we were working on this 3D knit for the back of the backrest. And um, this is the 3D, uh, 3D knit. I have like a sample of it here. So basically what they're able to do is um, knit uh, multiple um, layers all in one. So at the moment you have like one, one layer here at the back um, and three layers including the spill material on the front. So it's really quite crazy that they can <laughs> uh, knit all these um, layers um, at the same time and um, create this kind of cushioning effect. So you don't have to have any foam or any kind of um, additional material in there. It's all done in, in one part. And then, um, yeah, you're able to basically attach it to the chair. Um, but yeah, you, you can imagine it's quite difficult to to get the right um, fit, especially because the backrest was tapering and there, the the knitting process it goes in stages in different layers. So you have to kind of make sure that there are no kind of uh, weird transitions. Yeah, and this 
an overview of uh, some of the uh, different seat uh, upholsteries that we tried um, for attaching. So using 3D knits, um, having Velcro, having sections of the, the seat with um, a more of a flexible material. Um, yeah, but most of those didn't really work because um, there were just there was too much movement in the seat, unfortunately. So we needed something that was a lot more um, fixed. Um, again, more like a, a mobile phone cover, which really clicks on. So um, and we ended up going into a more of a, a, a molded kind of solution. Um, this is Kurt, also working in the, um, the model making workshop with one of the, the spring elements, um, shaving off some of the material. I think we still wanted to um, uh, have um, uh, or improve the movement. So we wanted to decrease the amount of movement that was going up um in the in the chair and have it more going back um maybe i can share a quick video um so you get a sense of the movement of the chair i haven't i've only showed that in the mom, uh, in the model but so you can see here it's kind of like rolling backwards um, and it does go up slightly, but it's because of the waterfall in the front edge, you don't really notice um, any pressure. So it's like that movement that we were really trying to get in the end. Exactly, yeah. And some of the colleagues in the test lab, this is where um, the brutal um, tests are done, um, you know, 20,000, 30,000 repetitions, sometimes even more, depending on what tests we're trying to withstand. In this case, it was, um, I think it was the BIFMA test that was being done uh, on this chair. So I'm not quite sure how many repetitions, but it, it runs for days and <laughs> sometimes it looks really painful for the chair. Um, but yeah, then it gets accredited and we have um, kind of a report which we're able then to say, okay, we've we've achieved a um, number of cycles with a certain number of Newtons um, and um, that helps us then go to the um, TÜV or, um, you know, there's different kind of um, bodies in Germany that then allow you to test um, the chair at their facilities obviously costs money and you have to take the, the products uh, there. So uh, having this done in-house helps speed up the process. Yeah, so the first parts are now coming out of the tools and um, kind of like building um, the first uh, zero series chairs, you would say, um, just to get a sense of everything is working. There are always like little well, problems with um, the first mold, some things don't work, or maybe um, that the tools shifted slightly or something is happening. Um, so you have to make sure that you have to work through all these problems. And we also were uh, working towards an Orgatech release. Orgatech is like the a furniture fair in Germany that happens or happened before Corona every two years. Um, I think this year is uh, the first time since Corona. And um, that's where a lot of the um, office furniture products are presented. So yeah, that was kind of like our deadline and we had to work towards that. Also working with our logistics team and packaging team to figure out how the product should be, um, yeah, um, uh, packaged to be sent for uh, easy transport and for online sales. And then it's also easy for the end user to understand how to put the chair together. So that was um, part of the process. And here we kind of built a jig to test um, the spring um, force to make sure that the parts are coming out of the tool um, functioning properly. So we had um, a kind of a jig just to assess, you know, every 50th mechanism that was coming out at that point to make sure that they were all consistent because consistency is really important for this, um, this mechanism type. And then also um, setting up all the jigs or the, the preliminary jigs in the factory. So also working with the factory uh, personnel um, who are gonna assemble this to make sure that it's as easy for them to assemble as possible, that there are no problems, um, that you know they can go through their shifts um, yeah, as comfortably as possible. So all kinds of jigs are built um, for attaching different components. In this case, it was for the, the spring element. So it there's a bit of a pretension in the system. So the spring would be, um, 
positioned properly by the, the jig and then you're able to attach the backrest and then um yeah with four screws basically the assembly is complete yeah just some more pictures also from from the um yeah the jig and assembly team on the left hand side it, this is kind of like a um yeah a machine they use for attaching the casters you need to have a bit of force so the the casters can um the star base can be just um held in place and then you can easily attach the casters without having to do it by hand or you know um, it can be if you're doing that all day it can be quite painful and some of the um, initial testing with product management and engineering for um, the upholstery so just getting a sense of how the upholstery works um, how it clips on if it's easy to to use and um, yeah just kind of like the final stages before launch yeah and just a picture of the first zero series we didn't have red casters these are just the um the protection for the for the casters when the chairs are sent out and that's it i guess that's uh the complete development of uh, c motion you can see here uh, the backrest on the table that's actually the mono sandwich um that i was telling you about so you can see the different um um material types so the dark materials are basically the the ones filled with glass and um the light the light colored one the white one is basically the pure uh, pp um and they're able to kind of control yeah exactly where it flows uh, to get that kind of flexibility uh, yeah and uh, i think oh i can share one more film uh, from the upholstery i think that would be quite interesting So you should be able to see the sales logo. Is that right? Okay, great. <laughs> so the seats just basically clips on. Um, And we developed these special kind of clips for the upholstery at the back. So they're quite big and you don't have to really look for anything. You can just, um, yeah, with one click of the hand, you can basically attach the, the back. Yeah, um, very easy for the the 3D knit. I think it's a bit more of a tight fit, so that <laughs> there's no film of that. But um, it is a bit more challenging. But uh, yeah, it's it's not that difficult if you think about you do it maybe once a year or so. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Carlo. That was an amazing story of so many people being involved and working nicely together. To produce this little neat chair so yeah well done and uh, looks like we've done pretty good with time as well so we still have some time and you can ask questions to Carlo via the chat function I've, I have a quick question first uh, just saying what happens to those chairs that you test so harshly <laughs> um, are they still surviving the, after the test uh, yeah it depends I mean some of them some it depends on which tests i mean some of the tests are more um yeah uh forgiving i would say so you could continue using the chairs um some of them do end up breaking um so um they'll have to be sent for you know recycling and then we have to also analyze what happens why did it break at that particular point i know with the armrests of uh, c motion that was quite tricky because there's one test that kind of pushes them down and out um so and it's done over a series of i don't know how many cycles i think it's something like uh, 30,000 cycles so um yeah and with more weight than you would expect it's as if somebody were to be sitting on the armrest um rather than just using it 
And in that case, yeah, there is some kind of deformation, um, but we actually came out quite well. Um, one of the surprises we got um, was with the BIFMA test that we had to withstand. That, that wasn't a part of the deal <laughs> at the beginning of the project, but uh, management then um, decided to, uh, they wanted to sell the, the chair also in the US. So that kind of came into the project later on. And actually when we we're already finished with tooling. So um, this lower section of the mechanism, we had to shift that back a bit which was a real challenge. You can imagine um, you're kind of adding material in the tool after the tool has been finished and all the testing has been done. So that wasn't uh, a lot of fun, but yeah, that was one of the critical points that really uh, broke. Yeah. When um, it, it didn't, it wouldn't have caused the problem for the end user, but it would have um, um, yeah, made the chair not, not functioning anymore. It wouldn't have functioned like it should have. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Questions are coming in. So here is a question from Alan Boyd. He says, any issue, uh, any issue without having height adjustable arms? Um, that's a good question. For this particular project, we didn't want to have height adjustable arms to begin with. Um, so we we started out with just the simple arms because um, we wanted this the side um, of the chair to be as open as possible. And when you have height adjustable arms, you have to move those um, further forward. I'm actually sitting on the second iteration <laughs> of uh, the C motion chair and I can quickly share. You can see here that does have the height adjustable yep. arms yep. and, but it's not as light and um, it, yeah, it, it just makes the chair a bit more bulky and there's just additional um, functionality. But yeah, the, it's a good point to begin with. We didn't want that, um, but as a, an upgrade or the second stage of the development, we added height adjustable arms uh, to the chair and a mesh back actually um, as originally planned. So um, yeah, we achieved, uh, yeah, it was more or less a, a cost target to begin with. And also uh, from a positioning standpoint, just the simplest chair and then um, in order to to fulfill some other requirements um, from the market, um, we we ended up having a height adjustable arms. Yeah. Another question from Isaiah Walsh: How does three D knitting work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's it's really yeah, it's it's magical. I I I, I visited um, several facilities um, and saw how they work. It's it's difficult to explain. I can only say that um, I have another sample here, for example. Um, this is from um, one of the suppliers that we worked with and it was one of the, the first backs I did in 3D knit. So I don't know if you can see, you can control the amount of fill material um, within the back. And you can basically, during the knitting process, um, the knitting machine is, is putting in these garns, which are um, under pressure. So the garns are kind of like flat and, are pretty much similar to um, the outer and, 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 and inner layers, you could say. But then when that pressure is released, they kind of fluff up and, and create volume. So um, yeah, it's, it's really amazing technology. Even having seen the machines, I can't explain more than that, um, that, that they are these fill materials, which are basically knit under a certain tension, and then um, once they're released, you could, you're able to create a, a certain amount of volume. And also how you connect the two layers, so you're connecting the, the front and back layers together, um, creates um, these pockets. Um, and so the material itself doesn't move around. You have to always have a connection between the two sides. Yeah. Great. <laughs> One more question here from Adam Barlow. Great presentation, inspiring. What was the development time and team size that delivered the chair? And can you talk about how this helped or limited the project? Oh, um, yeah, good, great question. Um, so initially, in the initial first week or two, um, working on the technical kind of concept, I would say we were pretty much all on board, all being like all three designers. So at Seros, there were three in-house designers. Um, and there were, I would say, four engineers, um, you know, um, coming together to kind of um, think about this technical solution, which then we patented. And um, that was really um, 
yeah, important to have a mixture of like um, experience, but also some of the younger colleagues um, just um, throwing out some crazy ideas. So that was really um, important, I would say, at the beginning. But then after that, going into like the design phase, it was just um, myself, Klaus, and um, uh, some of the um, the upholstery, obviously, um, uh, development, Pepco and and Court downstairs. Obviously, other people were involved, but that was the core team. And I think having that core team just work very closely together and um, and also having a direct link to management and being able to get decisions quickly really um, shaped um, um, or allowed this project to, to move really quickly. So I think, um, yeah, on the whole, just having a smaller team once we had the solution in, in place, like a technical solution was quite um, useful to be able to move fast. I hope I've answered the question <laughs> completely. I think you did. <laughs> so another question from Daniela Martinez. Uh, you mentioned this was a quick process. Can you give us an idea of how long you had for, the, for this design development and how it compares to other designs you have developed? How did you deal with this? Did you leave anything out the process of the process okay um yeah so all up i think it was probably one and a half years in of developing and design uh, design development until we we showed or presented the the chair at orgatech and then it was a couple of months after orgatech that the chair was available so um less than two years and i think all up yeah one and a half years within the development. I think now it's it's really fast. Um, and compared to other projects that I've worked on, um, it definitely, um, I think it was the constellation, not the complexity. I think we, we were quite lucky at the beginning. If we hadn't have come up with this technical solution that wasn't patented, that gave us the right movement, um, we wouldn't have we would have probably been struggling or searching for a, a longer time which is the case with other projects i've worked on i've worked on um as Oya mentioned at the beginning the on chair for example will Khan, that was um um uh, i was involved for three years but um the engineers were involved uh, i think for even one and a half years before that um coming up with technical solutions um chairs like fern for hayworth we were working on that chair for maybe five years um so um, yeah, there, there's a different level of complexity maybe involved, but I think, yeah, it has to do with um, um, a bit of luck at the beginning, but also just um, um, trying to achieve the simplicity allowed us to, to um, focus on these main parts and not have to deal with other things within a task chair, like, um, I don't know, lumbar adjustments and um, the height adjustable armrests, which came afterwards. So that definitely helped. I think it was, yeah, definitely a combination of, of the goal, but also um, um, having a bit of luck at the beginning to find such an elegant solution um, to begin with, because that's the trickiest part. And as I, I um, told you, the upholstery in this case was even trickier than the mechanism, which is not usually the case. <laughs> Uh, a few more questions for you. Christian Tietz, he's, asked, he's saying, great work, Carlo. Excellent to oh. see all the steps and all the testing and collaboration required with engineers, toolmakers, and manufacturers to make it happen. So there's not a question, it's just <laughs> tearing you up. Yeah, I think uh, Christian was uh, one of our professors at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he still is. He's here. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. And Mar has sent uh, your award link. Here is Christian. For the 2020. Hi, Hi Christian. Good to see you. Great yeah. to see you too. It's been so the a very next, long time. Yes, it has been too long. You should come over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Özlem Air from Istanbul. And she asks, how does the process of competitor products analysis work in new product development in deciding what kind of movement you want to provide that would be different than the competitor products, for instance. Okay. Um, different from the competitor products. Well, there is a kind of a um, yeah, consensus that the synchronized movement is really 
great. So I don't think we were trying to move away from uh, a synchronized movement because from an er ergonomic standpoint, I think it's, it's, um, it's quite a, a comfortable movement for the majority of people. So um, what we tried to differentiate here was the amount of um, lifting in the seat. So compared to other chairs that we, um, we, we saw on the market, um, uh, especially like um, weight activated mechanisms, which were still in a box kind of form, we wanted to, first of all, um, have it as part of the chair, the chair structure, but also uh, make sure that there wasn't uh, any kind of like um, pressure on the front of the legs. And another thing that was um, also in our minds and which I didn't mention, um, but which is quite important is also these, these kind of um, springs, they allow the seat to also um, flex forwards slightly. So you have a couple of degrees um, in kind of forward flex, which is also great if you don't like to sit towards the back. A lot of people like to sit towards the front when they're typing. Um, it kind of gives you a bit of um, um, this kind of forward tilt position. So that was something that we also thought about um, in the development of this um, particular mechanism as a yeah, potential differentiator. But um, yeah, in general, I think there's kind of a consensus for a synchronized mechanism, but it doesn't have to be that. If you look at a lot of Scandinavian products, um, there are different kinds of um, movements, which are also, um, you could say, ergonomic. Ergonomics in general, I think, is a is a tricky kind of um, uh, topic. Uh, I don't think there's like the perfect chair. You really have to stay, you know, moving. And, and you know, now with the height adjustable um, desks being used more often, I think that's a, that's a great thing because you really have to just keep on shifting your position. And having this, this kind of a recline is really um, useful to take pressure off your back and just to allow you to move. Um, but in the end, you really should, <laughs> you should stand up and move around. So. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem is us. We're not designed to to sit. <laughs> yeah. So and and obviously, uh, one more part of the question was, but with patents, I think um, you have to obviously do your homework. So we work with patent attorneys and we also do our research and then um, make sure that we're not infringing on any patents uh, at the beginning of the pro process. Um, not too, too far at the beginning because then you kind of uh, limit yourself. There are always ways around patents, <laughs> you could say. Um, it's just the way it is. But um, yeah, in this case, we, we tried to patent um, this um, as broadly as possible because we, um, yeah, the, the idea that at that point was to use it for different chair versions. So yeah, it was kind of like a, the heart of the chair, which would be used um, for multiple generations. Yeah. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Tukman Jansu from Italy. For the US market, do they prefer to send the complete product there or simply shipping only the mechanism and making the production of the backrest locally there in order to cut down the shipping costs? Thank you. Oh, um, I don't think they would build second tools in the US unless the volume was um, um, that large. So um, it wouldn't make sense. I think the backrest is also quite complicated. So you wouldn't just be able to yeah you could you could make a tool in the us i don't think it would make sense though uh it depends on volume i would say if the volumes are large enough then I, they would create um a separate set of tools but i'm not really sure what the numbers are like right now in the us so <laughs> next question is from miles park uh, he asks you explained that when the backrest moves the seat rocker tilts forward is this a unique approach and how was this uh, received by ergonomists? Um, it's unique in the sense that it, it rolls kind of backwards um, more than it goes up. Um, but um, weight activated mechanisms are on the market. So, um, you know, when we developed uh, C-Motion, there were other weight activated mechanisms, um, for example, um, in, in box forms uh, that you could buy from uh, suppliers. Um, some of them better than others, but I think in general, I think, um, yeah, this, this particular mechanism differentiates itself um, in, the, in the sense that it, um, yeah, it doesn't cause too much pressure and doesn't uh, lift you up as much as um, other mechanisms. 
as far as the from ergonomists, I think um, it's it's pretty much a synchronized mechanism. And as long as you don't have um, any any pressure points, like extreme pressure points, I think it's not a problem, um, especially for this class of chair. So uh, we also have um, connections with ergonomists that we work with or worked with at Cedos, um, and um, they they uh, test it. But um, it's always with with this kind of weight activated mechanism. It's always like a compromise. Obviously, you're not able to fulfill. Um, or you're not able to design it for every single person. Like I said at the beginning, if you, if you for example, have a larger upper body, um, then you have more of a lever. And so the mechanism will feel um, different um, in that particular case. But in general, um, it's a, a great approach for um, spaces um, where people don't adjust their chairs. So then I would say it's actually better than a fully adjustable chair. Um, I've heard stories of um people that bought chairs um or were studying for example um in Mannheim one of my friends he he um showed me their library and they had um some pretty cool chairs there and uh he said yeah the only problem he has is that he can't recline and um I said oh it's just a click of a button and he was studying there for four years and didn't know that you, you could actually uh, unlock the chair so that's that's a huge problem yeah the next question is from Ta Tamian, and she says, thank you for sharing so much insight. Now that the chair is complete, would, would there be something else you would do, consider, or add differently? And what was the most interesting thing you learned during this uh, product development? Um, what would I do differently? I mean, there are a lot of small details, I think, that I, you know, having time having had the time to kind of look at them and sit on the chair I, maybe i would do slightly differently but all in all i think um it came quite good together like um this this balance between function and, and, and ergonomics and um the design of the chair um yeah but there are certain details like for example the way the arm rest um uh, covers clip on uh, we wanted to have that as easy as possible but you do feel them on the other side of the arms for example and that's something that I don't know my fingers tend to go there all the time so in the second version that we did it's it's a different um a different approach um but yeah with with the cost targets and you know um different kind of goals I think it was justified um yeah, I learned a lot of things in this project. I mean, I've worked on mechanisms and and and, and task chairs, but I think, um, yeah, this particular chair, it was really um, just the simplicity coming up with a mechanism, basically out of such limited, um, um, just a limited amount of material, and also um, um, having it perform uh, really. You know, really, um, as as you as you expected, I think that was one of the the biggest challenges, and I was kind of skeptical at the beginning. Um, but working together with the team, I think that was, um, yeah, especially Klaus. <laughs> I think we were able to uh, achieve that, and upholstery, like I've said it a couple of times, but yeah, that was uh, super tricky getting the upholstery to work. Um, that it that it looks looks um good but also functions and um um as as it should that it's also easy to um to repair um all these things coming together and then you have all these different different fabrics that you have to consider as well and different stiffness and you know they it really is a big challenge um coming up with an upholstery solution especially when it's something that that is not just you know fixed on the chair so i think those two um things were really um, a big learning uh, was, yeah, uh, I learned a lot during that development. So I think the last question comes from Alan Boyd, but he has a comment too. He says, well done, a lovely, well-designed, simple chair. And his question is, when does the environmental considerations come in your design process? Well, um, yeah, I, th I think it should start from the beginning um of the process so making components out of you know single materials if possible um thinking about the different um 
uh, impacts that different materials have. In this case, not combining different materials that cannot be recycled. So at the back, they're both polypropylene. So you um, could um, recycle them. Um, and in general, I think there's a lot of like um, a trend towards like more natural materials, wood, bioplastics, but um, having functional plastics, I think is still very important, especially if you consider the lifespan of a product, uh, if you're able to, to think about longevity. And in this case, also being able to exchange the upholstery, the hard wearing parts and being able to use the chair for a longer period of time, um, you're able to kind of, um, yeah, get the most out of it. But yeah, at the beginning of a project, you really consider what materials, what technologies and um, where or what pos possibility they, they have um, for recycling. And um, if not, you know, what what is the outcome compared to other uh, materials? And then you can do a life cycle analysis, uh, which is sometimes really tricky because depending on which one you use, you get a different number. <laughs> so uh, you have to maybe do several or just also use your intuition. Um, for example, with with um, special tech, tech um, uh, special plastics like um, uh, glass reinforced plastics, um, you can recycle them, but you really need large batches. So I think it's not only the materials that you use, but also the infrastructure and the the whole kind of um, system you have in place. And I think here there's a lot of work to be done in the furniture industry, like really working to collaborate um, and to to get back a lot of these um, important materials and recycle them because on paper there you can recycle everything, but um, the infrastructure is just not there to do it um, in 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 the way that you would hope. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of work still to be done in that sense, um, communication and and um, and infrastructure. One last question uh, from Teresa Nidiri. Well done designing and creating the sea motion. Would the upholstery be machine washable with the clips in place? Yes, um, I have washed the back um, of this. The, the, the back can be washed uh, with the clips, um, but the seat is a bit more tricky. I think the seat, you would have to either um, have it professionally cleaned or you would have to replace it. Uh, it's unfortunately not the best solution. Um, yeah, but it was the one that kind of allowed for the longest possible use. So it's always a balance, you know, on the one hand, do you allow users to take it off and, and uh, easily? But then on the other hand, you know, it wasn't functioning as it should. So, yeah. So for the backrest, yes, for the seat, um, professionally cleaned or replaced. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Carlo. We came to the end of our time. And uh, we want to extend a heartfelt thank you to you for presenting this amazing story and sharing so much of it generously with us. Uh, so thank you. And again, big applause. It was really interesting for me to watch. Um, and to all our attendees, again, uh, thank you for joining us and making uh, the evening even more special with your presence. But before we end the session, I want to mention the next talk scheduled in three weeks for November 7, where Greg Abstom from Breville uh, will present our stories behind products number eight. So Greg is also an alum of the industrial design uh, program at UNSW, and he will tell us the story of the Hydropo Pro Plus immersion circulator for sous vide cooking. So stay tuned for the invitations. And I, I look, we look forward to seeing all of you again to our next stories behind products. Until then, be safe and well. Goodbye.